understanding of the structure of the atom has developed by the use of many different tools. Thompson used electricity to separate electrons out from atoms, showing for the first time that an atom was not a homogeneous, indivisible ball. Rutherford and many other scientists used the phenomenon of radioactivity, still not well understood at the time, as a tool to probe further, leading to the discovery first of the nucleus and then of the separate nucleons, protons and neutrons. Since then, most of the progress in our understanding of atomic structure has been all about the electrons. How are they arranged in the atom? What shifts and changes and forces are involved as they whiz around the nucleus? And the tool that we use to probe the electrons, to stimulate them, to get responses from them, to make them share their secrets with us, is light. So to understand how the 20th century got to grips with the electron in its atomic habitat, you first need to have an appreciation of what light is. I should say that the title of this video, The Nature of Light, is kind of misleading. There's no way I can do justice to the beauty and the complexity and the sheer usefulness of light in a short presentation like this. For that, you need to go and do more physics and chemistry at university and become a laser physicist or a solar engineer or a spectroscopist. But hopefully, I can at least give you a feel for how light accidentally became the most useful tool that we have for learning about the atom. Firstly, you need to know that the light you experience, you as a human, is only one tiny family inside a much larger ecosystem called the electromagnetic spectrum. A spectrum is something that can have any one of a continuous series of values. People talk about a spectrum of political opinion, meaning a, a, an opinion that lies somewhere in the range from progressive to conservative thinking. Or there's the autism spectrum, des describing a range of different levels of autism. The electromagnetic spectrum describes electromagnetic waves and the range of different wavelengths that they can have. Electromagnetic waves are a kind of wave that can carry energy through empty space. This is in contrast to waves such as sound or earthquakes which can only travel through matter. You're familiar with many forms of electromagnetic energy even if you didn't realize that that's what they are. X-rays, UV light, visible light, infrared light, which you experience as heat, uh, microwaves and radio waves, in fact, all of these things are electromagnetic energy, or in fact, forms of light. Being electromagnetic waves, they are waves of energy that can travel through empty space, as I said, and that can be absorbed or emitted or reflected by particles of matter. You may remember from junior science the anatomy of a wave. The distance a wave wiggles from its center point is called its amplitude. All of these waves here have roughly the same amplitude, but if I were to draw one with a much bigger amplitude, it would look like this. The length from crest to crest of a wave, or from trough to trough, is called its wavelength. The number of waves that pass by a fixed point in any given time is called its frequency. I should say pass by a fixed point in one second, in fact. If this is zero seconds and this is one second later, then the orange wave has a frequency of 4.5 waves per second. We call this 4.5 hertz. The unit of waves per second has its own special name known as the hertz. The blue wave, if you count them up, has a frequency of about 8.5 hertz. Looking carefully, you may be able to see that wavelength and frequency are inversely related. That's the same as saying that a wave with a long wavelength has a low frequency, while a wave with a short wavelength has a high frequency. Wavelength, frequency and speed are related by this equation, c equals f lambda, or f times lambda. c is the speed of light, and all forms of light, everything on the electromagnetic spectrum has the same speed, as long as you measure it in a vacuum. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. If c is a constant, you can see from that equation that if the wavelength goes down, then the frequency must go up, so that their product remains constant. Now, in a sound wave, the wavelength determines pitch. Different uh, sound waves with different wavelengths will have different pitches. Short wavelengths give you a high-pitched sound. Long wavelengths give you a low-pitched sound. In a light wave, the wavelength instead determines color, or more generally, the kind of wave. So from this diagram, you can see that radio waves have very long wavelengths, 100 meters or longer, and hence quite low frequencies. X-rays, on the other hand, have very short wavelengths, around one nanometer, or the size of an atom, 
and hence they have very high frequencies. The light that's visible to us, the light that our eyes have the right sensors for, has a wavelength of between about 400 and 700 nanometers. That's about the size of a small bacterium or a large virus or about 250 times thinner than the average human hair. Now the tricky thing about light is that although it's well described as a wave, it turns out sometimes to behave like a particle. In fact, this is one of the things that Einstein is famous for discovering, and it's called wave-particle duality. It turns out to apply to the electron and other tiny particles as well. So you can think of a beam of light from a torch as a wave of electromagnetic energy spreading out from the bulb. But you could also think about it as a stream of tiny particles, little packets of energy that have no mass. These light particles are known as photons. And it turns out that individual photons can be absorbed or emitted, which is the same as saying they're spat out, by atoms as though they were particles. However, even when you have an individual photon, and even though it is a particle, it still has this property of wavelength and it can still spread out and travel across space, uh, across space like a wave. Now we've said wavelength determines colour, but colour is really just how animal eyes and brains experience some of the wavelengths of light. The crucial thing that the wavelength of a photon tells you is how much energy it's carrying. And the equation that gives you this information is E equals hc over lambda. C is the speed of light which is constant, as we mentioned before. And h is called Planck's constant, which has a value of 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And you do need to know that this constant, this Planck's constant, is a phenomenally important constant in physics and chemistry. And if you go on to do more science at uni, you will be meeting it again. Anyway, you can see from the equation that if this part here is all constant, then as wavelength goes up, the right hand side of the equation gets smaller and smaller, which means the energy is getting smaller. So large wavelengths mean uh, small energy, and small wavelengths mean large energy. So this means that a photon that has a short wavelength carries a lot of energy, which is why UV light and X-rays, with their tiny little wavelengths, are quite dangerous. Those photons have, carry enough energy in them to burn your skin or to get into your DNA and start messing with the molecular bonds. Long wavelength photons, however, like radio waves, are pretty harmless, which is why we don't mind broadcasting radio waves from hilltop to hilltop. OK, let's move on and think about where light comes from. There are many sources of light in our world, but the greatest source of light that we have overall is obviously the sun. The sun produces masses of photons, and it produces them in a whole range of different wavelengths. So how does it produce all these different forms of light? When an object gets hot, it radiates light, radiates photons. The hotter it gets, the bigger the range of wavelengths that it emits. And if you average out those wavelengths, you find that the hotter the object, the shorter the average wavelength. This phenomenon is called black body radiation, or sometimes incandescence. You can see from this graph that moderately hot objects at, say, two or 3,000 Kelvin mostly emit infrared light and red and orange visible light. This is why hot iron glows red, and you can see this in the middle of this piece of metal here. However, keep heating that iron to higher and higher temperatures, and it will start to emit green and blue photons, along with the infrared and red and orange photons, until it's so hot that it's emitting photons from the whole visible spectrum. And it appears white hot, like the tip of this piece of metal. This is also how the old incandescent bulbs with the tungsten filaments worked. The electricity passing through the tiny tungsten wire caused it to heat up, and it emitted a whole range of wavelengths of infrared and visible light. Now, the surface of the sun is at a little over 6,000 Kelvin, which means that it em emits right across the infrared, white light, and ultraviolet spectrum. So if you take sunlight and you put it through a prism to split it up into all its different wavelengths and see the spectrum, you would expect to see a rainbow, wavelengths from every colour, including the invisible UV and infrared rays. So back in the 19th century, when scientists actually did this, using extremely powerful instruments to separate out the wavelengths, that's what they saw, sort of. 
This picture here is in fact one very long thin spectrum that has been chopped up and the strips have been rearranged into a rectangle. So you read it from left to right and from top to bottom like reading a book. And as you can see it's like going through the rainbow from red to blue. And the black bits at the top are in fact the invisible infrared light. What astounded the scientists was that in the expected rainbow-like spectrum from the sun were a whole lot of these little black lines, gaps where light of that particular colour seemed to have gone missing or to have been removed. Why this should be was for quite a long time a mystery, but as scientists began to examine gases of pure elements, they found something that gave them a clue. First, they took white light from a lamp and split it into its spectrum. And this is what it looks like, the familiar rainbow. Then they took hydrogen gas and they put it between the source of the white light and the detector. To the naked eye, the white light still looked white, but when it was separated into a spectrum, they could see that some wavelengths were missing. Black lines appeared where light of particular wavelengths hadn't made it through the hydrogen gas to the detector. And this was called an absorption spectrum, since the hydrogen must have been absorbing some light. And then they discovered that if you again took hydrogen and heated it up near a detector, then as it cooled, the detector showed a spooky reversal of the absorption spectrum. Although you were not shining light on it, the hot hydrogen atoms were emitting their own light, and they emitted it at exactly the wavelengths that it had absorbed when the white light was shining through it. This spectrum, the reverse of the absorption spectrum, is called the emission spectrum because the hydrogen atoms are emitting the light. Further research showed that not only did every element show this behaviour, but more interestingly, each element seemed to have a different pattern of wavelengths that it emitted or absorbed. These three emission spectra are from hydro uh, hydrogen, mercury and neon, and you can see that each spectrum is quite different and unique to that element, just like a fingerprint that identifies the element. So somehow, atoms of different elements interact with light in different ways, such that they only take in and spit out very particular wavelengths. It's as though each atom is a super picky eater at a smorgasbord of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what was going on with the sun's spectrum? Scientists realised that the black lines in the sun's spectrum were telling them about all the different kinds of atoms that were at or near the surface of the sun. As the sunlight radiated outwards, some wavelengths were being absorbed as they passed through the various elements that make up the sun. So the black lines were in fact a kind of secret code, almost like a Morse code, by which the sun was letting us know what it was made of. This discovery, vital information in chemistry and physics, also made a huge difference to the field of astronomy, since for the first time scientists had a way of remotely working out what other stars were made of. And it turns out that different stars have very different fingerprints. They're made up of different combinations of elements. This lithograph here from 1870 shows stars that were classified into four groups according to the lines in their spectra. However, the problem was that no one knew why it was that atoms were such picky absorbers and emitters. And it wasn't until collective scientific knowledge got to the point that scientists began to debate what electrons were really doing around the nucleus of the atom, some 40 odd years after this particular lithograph, that this long-standing puzzle began to be solved. And that's the subject of our next video.